Welcome to Series 2, Episode 4 of the In Her Financial Shoes podcast. Welcome to the In Her Financial Shoes podcast with me, Catherine Morgan, founder of The Money Panel, helping you to get financially naked. Listen in each week where we talk about that taboo subject of money. Listen to brutally real life stories, step into our guest shoes and be left feeling 100% confident and in control. Oh, and we hate financial jargon, so don't expect any here. Small steps, big wins, let's go. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the In Her Financial Shoes podcast. So we're really getting stuck into this particular series now, which is all around helping you to be more knowledgeable and confident when it comes to investing. And before I go into today's episode, I just wanted to kind of fill you in with a little bit about what's going on in my world at the moment. Uh, Quite a few people message me on occasion around uh, what I'm up to. And this week I was presenting at the Morningstar Conference. And the Morningstar Conference is a pretty significant conference within the financial services profession. And I was asked to go and speak about the power of emotional connection and how that impacts on what we call intergenerational wealth. So intergenerational wealth is about how we can actually educate all parts of the family journey. So not just looking after husband and wife, but looking after the children um, and how we kind of pass down that wealth through the generations. Now, for those of you that have been listening to this podcast or follow me on social media for a while will know how passionate I feel about making sure that we also equip and prepare women to be as financially resilient um, as as men to, you know, to have the confidence and control through every step of their of their life to stand on their own two feet. And one of the messages that I was sharing yesterday in, in my presentation was about how as a profession, often we focus too much on the end result, in my opinion, on the product, and we don't focus enough on the emotion that that's, that surrounds money because money is more than just money. Money is very, very emotional. And uh, I, I hope that, well, I think I had some really good feedback from the presentation that it landed really well and people were really inspired. Um, and I, I shared some of my personal story actually about how um, you know, I went through a particular situation in my life when my youngest son was born, Thomas, when he was just five weeks old. Um, he was diagnosed with bacterial meningitis and I spent a couple of weeks in the hospital with him. And there was a couple of moments in that particular experience that I had that really resonated actually with how different professions suffer with what I would kind of refer to as the curse of knowledge. It's this kind of, you know, we forget sometimes how much we understand about certain topics. So investing, for example, I often forget that being in financial services for 20 odd years, you know, I understand quite a lot about investing, but for some people, some of the basics are very confusing. And that's because I believe, again, in the financial services industry, we don't, um, you know, the, the, the language that we use is still quite complicated. And there's a lot of work to be done, I think, to be educating consumers like yourself. So that was what the topic of my presentation was about. And when I was in hospital with Thomas, the, the doctors at the time, when I when I first took Thomas into A&E, they kept saying sepsis, sepsis. And I, I kind of remember thinking, well, what, what's sepsis? I think I know what it is, but I was sort of frantically Googling what does sepsis mean? And then later found out, obviously, it's septicemia. And then we got the diagnosis that it was bacterial meningitis, which is basically the worst form of meningitis that you can uh, that you can have. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of part of my presentation. And that, that jargon at that, that particular time made me feel quite stupid. I didn't, I, you know, I felt like I should understand what it was, but I didn't really understand what it was. And it's, you know, it's every parent's nightmare to, to hear that your, your child has meningitis. And, and I do really believe that there is, a, you know, this curse of, of knowledge that in the medical profession, particularly, you know, how many times have you been to see a consultant, for example, and you've kind of looked blankly at the consultant when they're throwing this jargon at you. And I think it's the same in financial services, you know, what we need to do more to to, uh, simplify the language that we're using. So that's going to be my focus on the podcast today. 
And what I wanted to share with you is actually one of the videos from my online course. And the video that I'm going to share with you is called Choosing the Right Storage Solution. Now, I get this question a lot in my community about the differences between ISAs and pensions. And the number of times I've had this conversation, which could be probably five or six minutes long, and the impact that it has on somebody's knowledge is is, is quite astounding. And, and again, it's this curse of knowledge that uh, we forget sometimes that people don't really understand the differences between ISIS and pensions. So that, that's what you're going to get from this particular podcast episode. So what I would suggest that you do for this particular show is to grab a pen and paper because there will be a couple of things that I'm going to say to you today that you may want to make a note of. If you're not in a position to do that, then either come back and listen to it again, or um, you can just click on the show notes and go straight into the blog, uh, which is on the website, um, and you can just read through some of the key points on there too. So let's get going. So in this video, I'm going to talk about some of the different ways that you can get your investments to work extra hard for you, simply by making smart decisions about where to keep them. Now, once you've made the decision to actually start investing, and hopefully by now you've listened to a couple of the podcast episodes and are quite intrigued or maybe a little bit curious about investing, but once you've made that decision to actually invest, we've got an, you know, you've got an idea that you want to buy. The next thing is to look at where are you going to keep it? And this is important for two reasons. The first thing is that you need to be able to access your investment in a way that suits you. And this will very much depend on your goals and your intentions. So what are you investing for? You know, Do you need to be able to get your money quickly or doesn't that matter? So that's a very important question to ask yourself. What kind of access do you need to have with that money? And that will you know, the likelihood is that will be a key factor in whether you invest into an ISA versus a pension. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And the second reason is for tax purposes. So the tax that you'll pay on your investment and when you'll pay it will depend on where that investment is stored. And you can make some pretty significant tax savings depending on which platform you choose or which wrapper you choose. So if you think of investments as a bit like any other product, you know, when you buy something, whether it's a laptop or a new dress or a pair of shoes, then you have to think about the best way to store them. And if you store something properly, it's more likely to do a better job for longer. So in other words, you'll get more out of it. Now, you may have heard of different types of investment products like ISAs, uh, individual savings accounts, pensions, or otherwise known as SIPs. Um, a SIP is a sexy version of a pension. It's a self-invested personal pension. Um, which is exactly the same as a personal pension, just gives you a bit more choice and flexibility and funds and be completely kind of baffled by what they are and how they're different. So to keep it simple, just think of them as being like different storage solutions for your investments. So in other words, where you put your money. So if we go back to access and tax, that's pretty much what the differences boil down to between ISAs and pensions. In fact, products like pensions and ISAs are often called tax wrappers because the way that they wrap up or store our investments will influence the tax that you pay. And they have different rules around sort of getting your hands on your money. Now, I'm going to use my kind of trusty shoe analogy, as it's in her financial shoes, <laughs> to explain some of the, the, the sort of features of the main product type so that hopefully you'll start to see where, uh, you know, when you may or may not want to use some of these for your own investments. So firstly, I want to cover pensions. So if anybody listening to this is employed by a company, um, so anyone who is not self-employed, you'll probably have a pension through work. Um, and they call this auto enrolment. You would have also uh, seen a, a, an increase recently um, in, in April last month of the contribution that was at, is actually taken out of your pay and added into that workplace pension. And if you're self-employed, you may have or thought about having a personal pension. You may have perhaps been employed in the past. You may have a collection of, you know, three or four or five or six uh, pension pots that you've built up from previous employments. But lots of people don't necessarily realise that a pension is just a, a form of investing. It's a form of, um, you know, giving money to your future self, if you like. And especially if it's all been arranged through work and you've not had much to do with it. 
But that's exactly what it is. So you make a payment, usually monthly um, or sometimes annually if you're self-employed perhaps, or whenever you have money available. And it goes into a fund that you or your employer have chosen. And these funds sit inside this pension wrapper. So the pension essentially is just a great big bucket. It's a storage solution for that money. And a pension is one of the most tax efficient ways to invest. Now, let's just pause for a second. If you think of a pension being a bucket of money, I actually don't like the word pension in a way, because I think for consumers, for for those of you listening, when you think of the word pension, most people automatically think that's for when I'm 70, 75, you know, like my grandparents, like my parents. And I think that that's a big part of why people don't necessarily look at investing uh, and don't like the word pension because they think automatically about old age and, you know, well, I'm sitting in my 20s and my 30s, that's that's years away. When actually if you think of it as a big bucket of money, I think that changes the meaning and the purpose of, of, um, you know, investing for our future self. Um, But essentially, it is one of the most tax efficient ways to invest because when you pay money in, the government gives you something called a tax relief, which is based on your uh, income tax rate. So it's basically free money. You know, so if you pay, let's say you're a basic rate taxpayer. So you're earning, you know, maybe somewhere in the region of 15, 20, 30, 40,000 pounds a year. And you want to invest a hundred pound into a pension it only actually costs you £80 because the government will stump up the 20 quid and pay that directly into your pension pot. Now, when a fund is inside a pension, you also don't pay any tax on any money that that fund is growing by. So the investment growth that that, let's say that £100, £80 that's gone in from you, 20 from the government is growing, um, then you're not paying any tax on that investment growth. Now, it may come as a bit of a shock that the tax man would penalise you at all for investing, but the reality is that there are tax implications for any type of investment. And with a pension, the only tax that you'll ever pay is when you take money out of the investment. And that's normally just at your normal income tax rate. So if you retire at, I don't know, let's say you retire at 58 and you are a basic rate taxpayer at that particular point, then you will just pay 20% tax on any income that you take out of the pension. So pensions are great for saving on tax. Do um, You also have options in terms of how you draw those benefits. And this is really important because historically, what used to happen with pensions is you used to accumulate a pot of money. So forgetting final salary pensions for a moment, and I'll touch upon that in a second. But ordinarily, you build up a pot of money. And at the time you want to take those benefits, which at the moment you can take from 55 you would typically take 25% of the fund tax-free. You you didn't have to, but that was what most people did. And the rest of the money you would use and you would go and place that money with an insurance company, uh, a a pension provider, and you would go to them and say, this is how old I am, this is my health. If I give you this bucket of money, so let's say you had 100,000 pound, you took 25,000 tax-free cash, you have 75,000 left, If I give you my £75,000, what are you going to give me as a fixed income for the rest of my life? And they would ask you questions like, um, you know, are you married? Do you want that pension pension to continue to your spouse when you die? Um, Do you want a kind of a a guaranteed amount on that income? Um, Do you want it annually? Do you want it monthly? Do you want it quarterly? How do you want that paid? And then they would come back to you with with a figure. And and normally you'd say, thank you very much, I'll take that. And then they would give you that guaranteed income until the day that you die. And if you if you also tagged on to that a spouse's pension, that would pay to your spouse for the rest of their life. Um, now, that isn't the case now with pensions. Yes, you can still go down that route. That's what they call the annuity route. But you also have additional choices now that you didn't have 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, And this all changes part of what we call pensions freedom. So you have a lot more freedom now and flexibility as to how you draw those benefits. So to give you an example, as a financial planner, one of the areas that I really strongly believe actually that people should receive regulated financial advice is at the point that you're retiring. 
because what you want to ensure is that in that example, that £100,000, you want to make sure that that money is going to last you for the rest of your life. Now, one of the things that you should do is have a financial plan in place up until retirement to make sure that that pot's going to be enough. But what you also then want to do when you get to that retirement point is to understand what's the most tax efficient way for me to draw those benefits. And not just the most tax efficient way, but what is the most efficient way to draw that income in retirement based on my situation, based on the things I want to do, based on my health, uh, lots and lots of different factors. And it can get quite complicated. And that's at the point where I believe it's, it's worth you paying to go and see a regulated financial advisor. Um, so that's just a little bit about the accessibility in terms of what's changed with pensions. So if you think of it from that perspective, this bucket of money, if you didn't go down the annuity route, you would you know, have a bucket of money that you could just draw as and when you needed that money throughout the rest of your life. Now, they, they call this in the financial services profession income drawdown. So you're drawing down income that you need as and when you need it. Now, there is lots of um, technical aspects of this that we get involved in as financial advisors around, well, how much should you draw? How long is that going to last you? All of those things. But, uh, you know, at this kind of level, at this particular stage where you're just building your wealth, you don't need to necessarily worry about that. This is just making sure that you've got your money in the right storage solution in the first place. Um, now, pensions have been designed specifically to encourage you to invest for the longer term. So once you've paid money in, you, you can't access it at the moment until you're at least 55 in most cases. Now, this may seem quite harsh, but when you think about it, pensions are designed to help us build up enough money to have an income when we retire. So the fact that they protect us from being tempted to take the money out too soon and they give us the opportunity to benefit from long term investment growth is actually really positive. I think of pensions as being for your money exactly like, you know, like a sturdy box for your shoes. If you're invested in a really precious pair of shoes for a super special occasion, if you don't want them having, you know, kicking around on your wardrobe floor, you want to have them carefully wrapped up in, you know, some nice tissue paper and maybe stored in a nice box on your shelf. Now, it may be a pain to get to them, but you know that they're in, going to be in mint condition in the future. They're going to last you for ages. They're probably going to give you you know, get you the most out of your original purchase. So if your goal is saving for retirement and you know that you don't need quick and easy access to your money, then a pension is a really great way to be investing. Let's move on to ISAs, individual savings accounts. So you've got two types of ISAs. You have cash ISAs and stocks and shares ISAs or investment ISAs. Now, investment ISAs are another common type of investment product. And you may have seen lots of adverts for different ISAs in the run up to uh, the 6th of April this year. Um, and that's because there are rules around how much you can invest into an ISA every year. And the tax year runs from the 6th of April all the way up to the 5th of April next year. So we're often encouraged to put as much money as we can up to our annual limit into an ISA before the tax year is up. And there are limits for pensions too, but they're much, 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 much higher. And most people don't have to even worry about ever exceeding their uh, contribution allowances to pensions. So why would you choose an ISA as your storage solution? So first of all, your contribution for this tax year is £20,000 per person. Now that can be split between either cash or an investment ISA. You could do a bit in both. Um, it, you know, if you've got uh, ISA contributions from previous years, that's fine because you put those in in previous tax years. This is about actually physically how much you can deposit in a cash ISA scenario or invest in a stocks and shares ISA scenario for this tax year. So why would you choose an ISA as your storage solution? Well, like pensions, you can use them to invest in lots of different funds and get tax breaks. The tax breaks are a little bit different though. So with ISAs, unfortunately, the government doesn't give you tax relief on what you pay in, uh, uh, not on an investment ISA. So there's no free money on offer. But like pensions, you don't pay tax on any investment growth. And with ISAs, you don't pay income tax when you take the money out. So if you build up all your wealth in ISAs, um, and you then want to draw out money from those ISAs in the future, it's completely tax free. Woohoo! <laughs> um, and also, there's really easy access to ISAs, unlike pensions. So there's no, uh, you know, we're talking about just standard investment ISAs here. There's no uh, restriction on when you can access that pot of money. 
So the combination of tax breaks and being able to get at your money anytime makes them a super popular option for investors who are maybe looking for, you know, kind of a medium term investment. When I say medium term investment, generally speaking, any money going into the stock market should be able to be left undisturbed for at least five years, at least five years. Because even if you're going in a very low risk environment, you're going to have some wobbles um, in the value. And the last thing you want to happen is that you're investing for little Thomas's university pot in four years time. And you know you go to take that money out to fund the university fees and the stock market's gone down in that particular point and your money's you know gone down in value. So, uh, so that's what I mean by sort of medium risk investments or medium term investments, sorry. Um, or alternatively, for people who just don't want to tie their money up until they're 55, um, because you may maybe want to retire earlier than 55. But remember, the same principle applies to investments in an ISA as to any other investment. So generally, the longer that you leave your money invested, the better chances of that, you know, the returns are going to be. You know, the investments are very cyclical. They run on cycles. Um, and if you look at the previous performance of investments, generally speaking, the stats, if you invested over a 10 year period, have always outperformed cash. You know, but you're just going to experience some you know, kind of wobbles along the way. Now, depending on what level of risk you take will depend on how severe those wobbles are. Um, and as I say, well, we've talked about risk on previous episodes and we'll be talking more about investment risk on future episodes too. But back to our storage analogy. Um, I think of ice as like one of those kind of, you know, one of those drawstring bags that you often get with a, a, a pair of shoes or sometimes with a, you know, if you go to a nice spa, you get a nice pair of flip-flops in a drawstring bag. Um, so they're a great option for shoes that you want to look after, but probably not for those, you know, super special occasions. So the bag is a little bit easier to get into than the shoe box on the shelf that's gathering dust. And it still protects your shoes from getting dusty or scratched but it's not quite as sturdy. So your shoes are more likely to get damaged and you know may not last as long. Now, finally, I want to look at funds as a product in their own right that haven't got a storage solution around them. So yes, you can invest in funds inside a pension or an ISA and get those tax breaks that we talked about, but you can also invest in them on their own. And this is called kind of investing in unwrapped funds because they're not inside a tax wrapper like an ISA or a pension. So crucially, they don't kind of have the tax advantages. Now, when you invest, you're not buying a whole fund, you're buying part of one. So things like uh, unit trusts, um, exchange traded funds that we talked about on the podcast last week, you know, these are just this is just terminology and jargon about what we call collective investments. You're buying part of a fund. And I really wouldn't want you to worry at this stage about this. The main difference is kind of come down to legal structures. But as investors, they look and pretty much feel the same. So why would you invest in a fund that sits outside of a pension or an ISA? Well, again, if it comes down to what you've been, uh, you know, what you're investing for, what, what's the purpose? So, for example, it wouldn't make any sense to have be saving for retirement as a goal and not use a pension or, or at least for a good chunk of it for all of the reasons that we've talked about. But you might want the flexibility to build your own portfolio with some of your money and pick and choose specific funds. Or, for example, you may want to have some super easy access and you don't want to invest it for the long term for your pension. Um, and maybe you've already used your ISA allowance then that may be a reason why you would go into an unwrapped investment. Now, with an unwrapped investment, the tax treatment is quite different. So let me give you an example of a client I've recently dealt with. So this particular lady um, has had a really profitable year in her business and, uh, and she's been paying herself quite high dividends this year. And with some of the money that she's investing, she's used up her 20,000 pounds allowance already. So she's filled up her ISA bucket. She's making an annual contribution directly from her limited company business into her pension. She's making that as an employer contribution from her limited company. So she's getting some lovely tax relief on those contributions as well. It's reducing her tax bill on her business. Um, and she's building up that future bucket of money for her future self. 
Now she's still got further money to invest. And one of the purposes of investing this particular pot of money was so that she could then maybe use that pot of money to fund an early retirement goal before she gets access to her pension of 55. So she's decided to go into what we call an unwrapped fund. Now you often see these um, on on, on uh, investment companies platforms as like a, a general investment account, a GIA, that's typically what they would call an unwrapped investment. And the kind of tax that you would have on the growth that that fund would make is called capital gains tax. So you're allowed a certain amount of capital gains uh, tax free, but after that you're tax on any profit that you make. Now, it's important to know that that um, you only pay tax if you take your money out. So you don't pay tax on the growth when your money's still invested, um, but you pay tax when you when it comes out the other end. So a bit like buying a second property. If you buy a you know invest in a second property and you sell that property, you would pay a cap the tax on the capital gain that that property has made. And again, you'd have an allowance and different allowances that you can offset against that gain before you work out the tax. Now, looking at the storage analogy, unwrapped funds are like having all your shoes on the floor in your wardrobe or thrown into your porch way or into your utility room. You know, it's dead quick to open the door and get your hands on the pair that you want, but it's not quite, you know, quite as good in terms of preserving your shoes. You know, they're definitely going to get dusty, quite muddy, maybe a bit squashed or scratched, or, you know, your kids are going to throw all their shoes on top of it. <laughs> um, and so this is the kind of the worst case storage scenario when it comes to protecting shelf life and, and value. Um, so the main point I'm making with all of this is like a pair of shoes, you know, a fund is the same fund whether it's unwrapped inside an ISO or inside a pension. So you could go and buy, let's say, for example, you bought a Vanguard fund. Um, that's who I invest with at the moment, a Vanguard fund. And I could put it in a general investment account and I would pay tax on any profits that or any gains that I make when I draw it out. Um, and that may be suitable if I've used my ISA allowance already, uh, or I can go into an ISA or I can go into a pension. The underlying Vanguard fund is the same. It's just the wrapper that I'm putting around it. It's the storage solution that I'm putting around it. But your experience with that fund may be different. So depending on where it is, it will be easier or more difficult to get your hands on that money. And depending on the storage solution that you choose, that you'll be more or less protected from paying tax. Now, remember that any financial advantage can have quite an impact, you know, on your personal financial well-being, especially over the long term. Because by just consciously making this decision to invest for your future self, is so, so powerful. And you'll be you know, surprised about just even a small contribution to an ISA or a pension or a general investment account that isn't, you know, hasn't got this nice tax wrapper around it. The difference that will make to your financial future is huge. Somebody messaged me just yesterday on social media and said, thanks to you, Catherine, I've opened up a Starling bank account. I've managed to save 3,000 pounds since January because I've been more conscious about creating my pots. Um, and she's created this uh, fantastic spending plan off the back of completing two of my courses, actually. The first one the from Spenner to Saver course, which gave her all the tools and templates she needed to create the spending plan in the first place. She watched one of my videos on Facebook about Starling Bank. She made that decision to go and open a Starling Bank account, set up all her pots, create her spending plan, and then she did the investing course and she's now come to me and said, I've built up a little bit of an emergency fund, but I now want to start investing this pot of money that I've now saved for her wealth building. And she was asking me some questions about um, uh, what, what, what she should do. <clears throat> Excuse me. And her question actually was referring to her emergency fund. So I think she had built up something like £500 in her emergency funds. And we were just talking a little bit about how much she needs to put into that emergency fund before she should be considering investing. Um, because, you know, in an ideal world, um, talking about the foundations of financial planning, you should really have an emergency fund in place first. Because the worst thing you want to happen is you start investing and then you lose your job or you you're in, you know, you're working, running your own business and you, you're poorly and you have to have four weeks off and you've got no income coming in and you've got no money to back up your household expenses, for example. So it is really important to have an emergency fund in place, but that the amount in that emergency fund will very much depend on 
your personal situation. And we talked a little bit about this actually in last week's podcast episode. Um, so, but it just shows that the power of making conscious decisions about money, you know, even with this lady from January to where are we now? First week of May, you know, less than five or six months of having £3,000 saved and now ready to start investing, I just think is such a major, major change for her in her life. And this is super achievable for you too. This is just about baby steps, building those building blocks, building those foundations, and then starting on your path to financial success. So I hope that's been super useful for you. Um, as always, if you are interested in looking at the uh, full investing course, which will give you much more information about how to get started on your investing journey, then as a podcast listener or a blog reader, um, you can grab 20% off that course. Um, I'll pop the link to that and the discount code in the show notes. Um, but as always, if you've got any questions from listening to the show today or reading the blog, then just pop me an email across at hello at themoneypanel.co.uk. That's hello as in H-E-L-L-O at themoneypanel.co.uk. And I look forward to speaking to you again next week. Mm-hmm.